opening with one of our favorite songs, and that is a song called um, My Testimony. And what I love about this song is that it applies to not only you know, your big testimony of when, when God saved you, he redeemed you, he brought you back into the flock, but it's also a reminder of all the testimonies that God does throughout the week. And they're not always big and shiny, and they don't always have all these you know, flashy lights that go around with it, but it's just God continuing to be faithful. And as I was reading his word this week in John, um, there's a couple times when Jesus is just starting his ministry that he does these miracles that are pretty just like walk by, you know, he heals this official son and the official comes to him and says, my son is sick. And Jesus says, okay, go home. And he goes, okay. And he goes home and his son is healed. It doesn't take, you know, a big party or production or healing ceremony and anointing of oil. He just believes and God follows through. And the very next parable or the very next story of Jesus is now he's in Jerusalem and he walks by this guy who's been an invalid for like 34 years. And he looks at him and he says, do you want to walk? And he says, yeah. And he says, get up. And he gets up. And it doesn't require all these fancy things. So when people ask you your testimony about God, it doesn't need to be this huge, flashy story. It's just that continual story of God's faithfulness. I asked God this. He showed me this. And this is how he continues to be sovereign and reign over my life. So as we go this morning, um, let's go to prayer and let's thank God for his testimony and just ask his spirit into our presence this morning. Lord God, I thank you for you being who you are, for you not needing flashy lights and not needing to be this huge production every day, but just being this constant, steady strength in our lives. And I thank you for the testimony that you've given us of not only when you saved us, God, but the testimonies of how you continue to reign in our lives. So I thank you for that. And Lord, as we come to service this morning, I just ask that your spirit would be present um, and it would flow through this congregation as cool as the breeze that you have sent us. I ask for all distractions to be sent away. I ask for um, restoration and healing to be brought to those needing it this morning. And we just ask that your spirit would be here during today. In your name, amen. Let's stand and worship this morning. I saw Satan fall like lightning. I saw darkness run for cover. But the miracle that I just can't get over, my name is registered in heaven. I believe in signs and wonders. I have resurrection power. Still the miracle that I just can't get over, my name is registered in heaven. Yeah, my praise belongs to you forever. This is my testimony from death to life. Cause grace rewrote my story. I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous. I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. the sons and daughters walk with blood and washed in water sing the praises of the spirit son and father our god will finish what he started yes our god will finish what he started oh this is my testimony from death to life Cause grace rewrote my story I'll testify By Jesus Christ the righteous I'm justified This is my testimony This is my testimony If I'm not dead you're not done greater things are still to come oh I believe if I'm not dead you're not done greater things are still to come 
man of sorrows, Lamb of God, by his own betrayed, the sin of man and wrath of God is been on Jesus laid. Silent as he stood accused, beats and marked and scorned, bowing to the Father's will, he took a crown of thorns. And all that salvation where your love poured out over me and now my soul cries out hallelujah praise and honor unto thee sent of heaven Oh 
it is to express our praise and thanksgiving to God, which we're doing. And uh, we're reading the scriptures that with praise and thanksgiving, we're to bring our requests to God. I don't know what the requests are that are on your heart, what concerns that you have, but God does want the church as we gather to be a people of prayer. So we're going to pray this morning, we'll pray for each other in the sanctuary, but let's pray for those who are not here with us, those who are participating really through uh, the internet. We have a nation that needs God's provisions. We've got a world, a lot of need in the world right now. Tremendous suffering going on and will go on in Afghanistan. Christians being persecuted. And because the heart of God has been placed in our heart, we have to have some care for those people. So let's uh, bow in prayer. Will you join me and pray with me as we bring these concerns and cares to God himself? Our Father, we thank you this morning. You are worthy of our praise, our trust, our confidence, our obedience, our followership. We thank you that you have invited us to come boldly to your throne of grace and to present our needs to you, which we do. And so, Lord, you know each one of us as we are bowed before you, whether in this sanctuary or in the home where we are. You know where we are, what we need. And in Jesus' need, name, we trust you in your grace to minister to us, to show us the way, to strengthen us, to provide the courage, the comfort, the hope, the direction that we need. And Father, we know that you so loved the world that you gave your only begotten Son. And Lord, what a needy world this is. We want to pray, Lord, for those who are in the midst of war and oppression and killing and maiming. We want to pray, Father, that you would bring peace and relief to those areas of the world. And Father, we want to bring to you the Christians who are being persecuted and beheaded what evil is in this world? We pray that you would stay the hand of Satan, that you would limit his power, that you would protect your people, that you would give them the strength to stay true to Jesus even as they die for him and in his name. And so we pray for them and ask for your help for them. And Lord, you've told us to pray for the leaders of our nation. And so together to, this morning, we pray for our president, the administration, Congress, Senate, we pray really, Lord, that you would give wisdom and guidance and direction. Lord, will you revive your church across America in such a way that we become outstanding people of love and grace and righteousness and servanthood, that it causes people to say, this must be <clears throat> by the grace of God. And would you bring an awakening to our nation, Lord? And would you heal the great divisions that divide us? Would you take away the hatred that seems to motivate so much speech and so much interaction with people? We bring that need to you. And then, Father, we just pray, we'd pray for our own city, that you'd be with our mayor and the leaders of the city, that you would help us, Lord. You know the violence that's in our cities. And we pray, Lord, that this will be changed and that the peace... You have said that if we would seek first your kingdom and your will, we pray that your will will be done on earth, even as it is in heaven. And we pray that the uh, conformity to your will will begin in us as we go forward. So, Father, we thank you for this opportunity to pray for others in Jesus' name. And as we're together now and we're getting ready to consider your word to us, we pray that you would use it to develop our faith, to give us direction, to help us become all that you want us to be. So in our life, whether it be by thoughts or by words or by deed, that we would bring honor and glory to you. We ask for that help in Jesus' name. Amen. Bibles. Uh, 
This morning we're going to be reading from the first letter of Peter in the fifth chapter and the seven verses. To the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder, a witness of Christ's sufferings, and one who will share in the glory to be revealed. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, serving as overseers, not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be. Do not be greedy for money, but eager to serve, not lording it over those entrusted you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief, peer, when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. Young men, in the same way, be submissive to those who are older. All of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another because God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. Cast your anxiety upon him because he cares for you. Amen. How many people enjoyed yesterday's beautiful weather? Beautiful, wasn't it? Um, just so glad the heat broke, and I went um, out to Cato uh, to work in the woods. And um, on the way back, uh, Randy Jr. says to me, <laughs> hey, is any of this going to be in the sermon tomorrow? And I'm like, no, no this is going to be in the sermon. Um, Yesterday, in Cato, we were cutting some trees down and um, milling some lumber and all that kind of thing. And it was, it was just a, a beautiful day. And, um, and I, at one point, turned and I saw Randy Jr. Um, on one of my barns. The, you know, since we haven't been up there for a long time, as in 14 years because I've been here, the, the trees have started to grow up alongside the barn. And I saw Randy cutting them down. And I, and I, and I saw them all down. I said, oh, that looks so beautiful. And, and I thought this to myself, you know, there's a difference between you ought to in life and you're willing to in life, okay? And in that moment, my appreciation, because Randy was willing to do something I didn't ask him to do, but willing to do something that he saw that, that needed to be done. So, Randy, you are in the sermon today, so congratulations. Not because you must, but because you're willing. You're going to find out in life that you're going to fall into one of those two boxes so many times. Is this idea of you ought to or are you willing to do it? And, and, and how we come through all those different questions is, is, is tough at times. We all have responsibilities in life, every single one of us. Some are inherited because of our position. Some are self-imposed because of the, the, the positions that we take or what we do in life. Some responsibilities are others' expectation on us, Right? You, you make friends or you make neighbors and all that, then all of a sudden they have expectations on you. And, and you have a question, is, should I, ought to, <laughs> ought I help them or am I willing to help them, right? You have these, these questions that you can go for. Um, there are responsibilities of position in life. Parents have responsibility to children. And children certainly have responsibilities back to their parents. Job titles have responsibilities, Manager, teacher, police officer, fireman, they all come with responsibilities. And Christians also, by taking on Christ's name, and taking on his likeness, we then become, have a responsibility to become more like him. And so we see these responsibilities all around. And when our lives get busy, in which they do, we can struggle with responsibilities. You know, adults, as you grow into adulthood, then you have two responsibilities. If you have children, as an adult, you also may have grand, or you also have parents. And so there you can see where the busyness of life pulls you in two different directions. Your, your kids, but you also have parents to care for. And so you can see that in life. You can see that we struggle with these responsibilities. And like even in the simple thing of job, if you have a job and then you have the idea of vacation, we can't really do both at the same time. I mean, we, we try, but we, we can see the pull from each of them. And, and in, the, in, in our relationship with God, 
we certainly have a responsibility to God, and at, and at the same time, we have a responsibility to self, right? That, that is, we grow up with this idea of me, feed me, help me, and all this kind of thing. And so we can struggle between God and self in our own lives. And in this passage of 1 Peter chapter 5 in these first seven verses, when we look at verse 2, Peter is reminding us to be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, he says. Now, we understand Peter's language here because this is the same language that Jesus used to, in a sense, wake him up to his responsibility to be shepherd of of Jesus' flock. Do you love me, Peter? Do you love me, Peter? Do you love me, Peter? Then feed my sheep, help my sheep, serve my sheep, and all that kind of thing. And so here is a mature Peter writing a letter to the church, and basically he is saying to the same question, I appeal to you as fellow elders, I appeal to you as fellow Christians, I appeal to you, please be shepherds. In verse 1, he shapes our response in this way to shepherding. When we think about our responsibility as Christians to be shepherd, Peter sets us up in verse 1 and says this, we are all to be shepherd to someone and all of us have shepherd responsibilities. Just think about that in your life. And, and sometimes in our life, we want to limit what we're responsible for because we get too busy. It's kind of natural, right? I want to cut my categories down. But we have to understand that if God is leading us in life, then the Spirit is going to shape our responsibilities in different areas that we have, and He's going to show us different responsibilities that we're going to have. Christ's suffering, in verse 1, is to be taken into account. Remember, Christ's shepherding of us, Christ's shepherding of the disciples, what Christ did caused suffering in His life. And so Peter wants us to be aware of it. Please understand that in shepherding, there will be suffering. The great shepherd suffered in shepherding people. But in that same verse, he also says this, you will also share in his glory. So there's the suffering of Christ, which we will share in, and there's also the idea of we will share in his glory. These two reminders, one's an example, right? This is Christ's example, Christ's work, okay, of, of, the, of really how he shepherded, and we can see that. So we have that. But one is the idea of a reward. And I don't know, but sometimes that's the thing that kind of motivates us a little bit in life. If you are to do this, then you're going to get that. Maybe that's how simple you are in life, and you say, you know what, that's all I need. Jesus has promised me a reward, a promised me to, to be with him and all that kind of thing, and all I have to be is a, is a good shepherd, so I'm going to go out, boom, and do that. And, and maybe that's going to drive you, and maybe that's going to motivate you. But both the example and the reward should shape our attitude towards shepherding. It should sober us in the one side to understand that, hey, you know what, it's going to cost us something. Suffering is going to cost us. But it also should excite us and say, you know what, someday... I'm going to be in the presence of God in his glory, and and I'm going to be with Christ. And I'll have some conversations with him. I'll have some questions for him. But you know what? But in both those examples or both these things that Peter is saying to us, we have to understand this. We're not alone in our suffering. In your shepherding, sometimes it feels like it's only you and your responsibility to this person or to this thing. But what Peter is trying to make us understand is, no, you don't understand. Christ is with us in the midst of this. Peter continues in verse 2 with two possibilities of our attitude in regards to shepherding. Do it because you must. The position that you have requires it. You're a mother, you're a father, so take care of the laundry, take care of work, pay the bills. These are things that we sometimes we fall into, fall into those categories. You know what? I must do this. I must take care of this. But Peter, Peter says, listen, there's also this idea of do it because you're willing. The people that you are responsible for, the people that you are shepherding, you care about, that you love, that you have compassion on. 
So you can see where we can do this, go through life and say, you know what, I must do this today, or you know what, I'm really willing to do this. But those two questions come down to one of attitude. Now the final thought in verse 2 is somewhat obvious. God wants you to be willing. Isn't that interesting? God says, you know, I want you to be willing to do this. I want you to be willing to shepherd. I want you to be willing to love. I want you to be willing to care. But it, you have to know that there's this other part of you that's going to fall into this, oh, I guess I ought to do it, so I'll do it. First question. Why do we do so many things in life out of the must-do box. You know, when it comes to church, well, the pastor asked me to serve in the nursery. I guess I ought to do it. When it comes to the holidays, well, the in-laws asked me over again, so I guess I ought to do it. Well, the lawn looks like it's getting longer. Well, I guess I ought to do it. And you can see lots of times in life we are focused on this I ought to do box. Why is that? Why are we not always eager to shepherd? Why are we not always eager? We're not always willing to do. And then when we're not, we fall back into this ought to thing. When we think of shepherding opportunities, sometimes, a lot of times, when here is an opportunity to shepherd or to help somebody right here, what happens in our life if we go through this thing of this? Well, what I'm doing right now is more important than the shepherding that needs to be done. We do it really quick in our mind, but it happens. Sometimes we just say, you know what, there will be another opportunity later. But right now, what is most important is what I'm doing. And so I'm not going to enter into that. Now, I can go down a little bit more deeper into our mindset. And we can talk about things like, well, I don't really like that person anyways. And so, you know, shepherding them or helping them becomes this little bit harder thing. And then we move down from there. We say, you know what, it's a waste of my time. And then we move on to, hey, you know what, they're really not worth it. And then we move from there and, no, you know what, they don't even deserve it. One thing that happens when we serve out of the ought to box or must do box is we start to lord over situations. We start to lord over people. We get frustrated with our flock's behavior and we become more directive in our role as shepherds. So it's no longer a, a thing where I'm, if we want to look at it from the shepherding as in real sheep, it's no longer this idea of leading the sheep into green pasture or, or, or streams of water or moving them into shelter. It's more I grab a stick and I whack a few of them and tell them to get going and, and it's more of an aggressive role into pushing them to the positions that I think they should be in. And that's what happens in life to us. And we, and we wonder why we get a little bit of anger at people when they're not being quote-unquote shepherding the way we want them to be shepherd we get frustrated with them it's probably because we're doing it out of the I ought to do this or I must do box and not out of the willingness box how do I know this just take a look at Jesus coming into Jerusalem and overseeing the people there and he sees them with such compassion tears come down his eyes and he says if only I could shepherd them See, Jesus isn't coming from the, oh, I ought to do this box, or I should do this box. He's coming, I'm willing to shepherd them. And when I come out of the willing to shepherd box, there I have compassion, there I have love, and there I have also some other things called understanding and context and things like that. Sometimes it's, in shepherding, it's, it's, we want this quick results with, with, with the sheeple. Right? I know there's, in farming, there's, there's a few different, two different types of farmers. There's the ones that really, in the sense, whip their herd into shape. And there's the ones that are gentle and, and caring. And, and both produce milk. 
but I know the one that's whipping and pushing and all that kind of thing, his enjoyment of the farming isn't as good as the one that is willing to work with the animals in a more compassionate way. We always want to shepherd quickly. With our children, we want them to learn quickly. Hurry up, grow up quickly. With people, hey, I helped you. Get yourself together. Let's go. I don't want to shepherd you anymore. You'll see that in your life. When will they learn? When will I not have to help? And all these questions come into us. In the end of verse 3, though, Peter reminds us that as shepherds, we are to set examples to others. Now, isn't that interesting? Who would we be setting examples to? Well, you could say, well, he's possibly talking about setting examples to other shepherds, other elders in the church as they shepherd. You know, I'm going to shepherd this flock. Hey, pay attention what I'm doing here. That could be true. But most likely, the most person that you're influencing when you're shepherding is the sheeple. They're the ones that are learning from you. They're the ones that are seeing your, oh, serving out of the auto box or you serving out of the willingness box. Compassion, demonstration of shepherding. Why is Peter doing this? He's reminding us that this is hard and it gets frustrated at times. And, and when we're, we're shepherding, our emotions get involved and all that kind of thing. And sometimes we don't have the love we should have and all that. But he's saying, hey, listen. You are being an example to others on how you shepherd. In verse 5, those who are being shepherds have a responsibility. Those who are being shepherded, right? Okay, so we understand that the people that we're working with have a responsibility. They have a responsibility to submit and be submissive. They have a responsibility in the sense to obey the shepherd. And he uses the word there, young men, meaning young, immature, not elders. And that's true. But even if that's the call of Peter to the young people, to the people that you're shepherding, when they don't do that, what happens to the shepherd? He becomes frustrated with them. And he says, hey, you're supposed to obey. You're supposed to be willing. You're supposed to be shepherded. You're supposed to follow me and all that kind of thing. It's in a way that Peter is saying, like, this is the way it should work. This is a reminder to all of you, both the shepherd and the, and, and the people that are being shepherded. You have responsibilities in both ways. But in real life, you and I both know that this isn't always the case. They don't always want to obey. They don't always want to be led. They don't always want to be helped. But that doesn't change the responsibility of the shepherd to them. It really just makes us as shepherds work on our attitude and say, you know what, why am I getting so frustrated And most likely it comes back to this idea because I'm doing this because I ought to, not because I'm willing. Because if I was willing, I would certainly understand the human condition. I'd understand myself, and I'd say, okay, I'm going to come at this from a different perspective. Peter then addresses both the shepherd and the people being shepherded. Both of them at the same time. He has the same ask for both of them. He says, listen, all of you, that's everybody, need to clothe yourself with humility towards each other. What is that idea of humility? Humility is certainly an attitude, right? And he just says, look, God opposes. God doesn't like the proud. And what does it mean to be proud? It means that you're certainly not humble. And God also shows favor to those that are humble. Humble yourself under God, then let God lift you up. But when you're not humble, you think of yourself as more important than others. Understanding our responsibility is part of being humble. 
also understanding that God is the judge of us and, and God is the one that shows us our value in life and in, in his presence. We have to keep those in consideration. And then finally, Peter says to cast all your anxiety onto him who cares for you. Now, just think about this. So he's already warned us in the first two verses that there's going to be suffering. And now he's really telling us, look, you're going to have some anxiety in this idea of shepherding. Suffering and anxiety. Two things I want more in life, right? No, we don't like those type of things. See, this anxiety that Peter is talking about, that we do somewhat have a desire to do something, but our, our, our desire is accompanied by this uneasiness of life, that deal when we deal with these people. And so I have a desire. I certainly do not want to see people not be helped. We all would agree there. Who wants to help people? Everybody raises their hand. Who wants to see people suffer? Everybody says, no, we don't want to see that. But anxiety happens because we know that we want to do something about it, but the situation in life and what comes along with it makes us uneasy because we don't know what to do, or when we do it, we get frustrated with the people that we're shepherding. So really what Peter is saying, look, cast your anxiety. Bring these concerns, this uneasiness of your shepherding and the people that you're shepherding, bring them to God in prayer. Dear God, I see that you have made me a shepherd over these people. I see that you've given me a responsibility over these people, that you want me to help them, that you want me to shape them, whether it's my children, whether it's my coworker, whatever it is, but I get that. But Lord, do you know how frustrating it is to deal with them? And so I just want to bring this anxiety, this, this feeling of uneasiness, and I'm bringing it to you, and I'm just saying, Lord, wh what do you want me to do? I think that's a fair prayer. But Peter is addressing a big part of our lives. This isn't something that we can compartmentalize and put over here and say, you know, we'll deal with this next week. This is a big, tremendous part of our life. Because you've got to understand this. You are either shepherding or you're being shepherded, or both. Throughout everything in life, you're going to notice that. You're either shepherding or you're sheepling. Just depends on where you are and what relationship you're in. But we're both today. And so when Peter turns to us and says, you know what? I want both of you. He's really talking to you and me. I want both of you in one of those circumstances, whatever you find yourself in at any given moment, I want you to act with humility. And really the only way to get to be humble in life is to see yourself less important than you think you are, Right? I need you to bring that into the conversation. One of my um, tenants that rents from me um, passed away this week. And um, how I found out is I stopped to see his sister. And I was on the front porch and she says, oh, by the way, my brother died yesterday or today or whatever it was. It was very great right then. And I was taken back a little bit. And in that moment, pay attention, I was thrown into a shepherding position. Because the, the, the sister was hurting and I was there and part of, and I had something in common with her and that's the knowledge of, of her brother. And so now thrown into that shepherding position, I didn't really, no, I didn't intend to be thrown into it, but I sat there and listened and we talked about him and we talked about who he was, but I didn't expect to, that day when I pulled up to her house to be, be a shepherd. And here's the thing, that I didn't realize as I pulled away and I was thinking about his life and as I left her there and, and, I, and I thought, well, you know what I ought to do? I ought to call his other brother. Right? I, I mean, in other words, I, I ought to pay attention. I ought to because it, it would be nice for me to call the other brother and say, hey, I heard that your brother passed. My condolences. I'm sorry to hear this and all that kind of thing. 
And so I did. I called and had a great conversation. But you won't believe what happened next. The next day, and I also called his wife, right? So now I've done three contacts in the family. The next day, a, another sister calls me and said, hey, why didn't you call me, pastor's words, and shepherd me? Whoa. Did you see what just happened? Is I ought to do this, and I did, and I was willing to make a couple phone calls, but then all of a sudden, I, I get a phone call that, that she asks, well, why didn't you shepherd me? And it kind of set me back for a second. I'm like, you know, I really don't know the answer to that question. That next day, I brought a delivery of, of hardwood flooring to the guys there, laying hardwood floor. And, and so I was up on top of the trailer. I was unhooking the hardwood floor, and I was passing it down to them. And all of a sudden, there was this lady next door who came out and saw me, and she started screaming at me from 50 feet away and telling me about this and that and just, you know, all these kind of things. And all of a sudden, I realized, oh, yeah. She's the niece of the guy that passed away. And so now here I am dealing with a bad sheep, right? It's a bad sheep over there. Good sheep are the ones that are nice to you. Bad sheep are the ones that yell at you. Isn't that how it works? And so here I am, and, and, and what, what wants to come up, Rick? You know what wants to come up inside of me? I want to get a little bit of feisty back and throw a board at her, right? So I didn't do that because I didn't. And, um, and we unloaded the trailer, and I went inside to see how things were going inside the house where the wood was going. And all of a sudden, the bad sheeple comes in. And she's got me cornered, right? And all of a sudden, though, because of my not a bad reaction outside, she looks at me, and then she turns, and she puts her arm around me, and she starts crying as we walk out arm in arm out the door outside and we have a conversation. Right? Because now I am shepherding again and that bad little sheep has found some humility and realizes that, hey, I'm not out there to hurt her. And so we had a conversation and we talked about her uncle that died and what it meant to her and all the kind of thing and, and all that. And she was so broken. But you see, I had to start all the way back and be willing to start to shepherd and then all that stuff works through. See, I did some of that shepherding because I ought to. I ought to make this phone call. It's probably the right thing to do. And I did some of it because I was willing. I really was willing to, to reach out to them and, and, and help them in that time. But this thing, I, this is what I realized is we miss great moments to shepherd when we let the sheeple get to us. You hear me? We miss great moments of shepherding when we let the sheep get us and frustrate us and we start becoming something that we shouldn't be and we start moving into what Peter says, lording over them, right? And so here are some thoughts that I'm going to leave you with today. Number one, sheep always need boundaries. I'm talking about real sheep right now. Sheep always need boundaries in the sense they always need a fence and something to keep them where they should be and to keep other things out from them. So as a shepherd, part of your responsibility is, is keeping the boundaries for them defined so that they don't go where they shouldn't go and nothing gets them that shouldn't get it. When you're a shepherd, you have a responsibility. I don't know what that means in your life. I don't know what that means, but I know that all sheep need boundaries. Number two, sheep always need caring for. They're, they're pretty helpless little animal. They always need to be brought into pasture. They always need to be brought to the water. Think about it, when Jesus uses the idea of sheep, what are they doing? They're wandering off. They're getting lost. They're falling into holes. So keep that in mind. Sheep are always going to need caring for. So in your shepherding position, you better get it in your mind right away. You know what? This is the long haul. 
You see, sometimes I think some of us think we're, we're, we're shepherds because we stopped on the side of the road and a sheep was walking by. We stopped and blocked all the traffic, let the sheep go by safely. And we get back in the car and say, I was a great shepherd today. No, you weren't. That's not a shepherd. That's just being thoughtful. Being a shepherd means you're in it for the long haul. Understanding that sheep will always need caring for. Number three, sheep grow up just not fast enough. Right? We are always dealing with people that we wish that would become more mature quicker. But the people that are shepherding us are thinking the same thing. I wish they'd grow up and get a little quicker and mature. And then finally, God is looking at us and saying, you know what, I wish they'd grow up and get a little quicker, or get a little more mature. And Paul says this way, you are still drinking milk and by now you should be off that onto what? Real food. Okay, so there's nothing new here. Sheep grow up just not fast enough for us. Number four, sheep learn from shepherds. Sheep learn from shepherds. You will see different shepherds and how they do things and all that, but this is what they're going to learn from you in life. Are you humble or are you prideful? And if your sheep are learning that you're a prideful person, you're going to raise prideful sheep. And then when you go and try to herd a prideful sheep, you got yourself rams, right? Okay. Number five, shepherding is for a purpose. Go back to the real sheep. Why in the world does a farmer raise sheep? Two reasons. Wool and food. That's it. What are you doing? Why are you shepherding? What's the purpose? What's the point? Is it behavior modification? In other words, you're trying to get those that you are shepherding to do something or to move in a certain way? Or is it heart changing? It's two different things. Behavior modification is the changing of things that you do. Heart change is changing of the attitude and how and when we look at things and what we want to do in life. What are you doing as a shepherd? And if you find yourself, you know, I'm always looking for behavior modification, you're probably not looking at deep enough and looking at the root, and you should be looking at heart change. How do I bring these people that I am shepherding to a heart change? Number six, what reason are you shepherding? <laughs> right? Why are you doing this? Out of the out to, out of, I ought to do this box or the willingness box? This is, has a lot to do with the way you view shepherding. It has a lot to do with your attitude in life. In verse 1, Peter says, I appeal to you. Peter is talking to the elders. He says, I am trying to speak to you in such a way to get you to see something. His appeal to them is the same appeal that Christ appealed to him for. Peter, do you love me? If you love me, then feed my sheep. Peter, if you love me, be a shepherd. Peter then says to the church and the elders, I appeal to you, please be a shepherd. And don't do it because you ought to, because you're in that position, but do it because you're willing to do it. Be a shepherd especially if you think sheep need it. If you see stuff that you know could be corrected and all that kind of thing, most likely you could be a good shepherd because you can see. So do it because there's a need. Think about that in your life. Shepherding is a is a lifetime commitment. I mentioned that a little bit earlier. But look, shepherding can become a way of life. Lots of times we want to enter into shepherding and pull back out of shepherding. I shepherded this person today, now I pulled back and I went home. But the most successful shepherds are the ones that make it a way of life. This is who I am. This is who you are. And this is what God is calling me to. I'm not pulling in and out of it. I am a shepherd. We're all called to shepherding. 
brothers to sisters, moms, dads, friends, co-workers, neighbors, you name it. Every single one of us are called, and because of the circumstance in, you are going to be pushed into a thing where you're going to be asked to shepherd. Know it. Own it. Grab a hold of it and say, you know what? This is what I should be doing. I think it's very interesting when Jesus is on the cross. I mentioned this in the Sunday school Sunday school class today. Jesus is on the cross, and John is there at the feet of the cross. And Jesus then gives John the most impressive, the most impressive shepherding job he could ever do. Jesus says to John, John, will you please shepherd my wife or my mom? Will you take care of her? And now here's this tremendous responsibility. And John grabbed the hold of it and he and he did it. You see, there is God standing before us saying, listen, would you just shepherd this right here? And here's the thing. This all has to do with one simple attitude in our life, and it's this. We don't shepherd because we're not humble enough. We don't shepherd because we not truly identify ourselves as who we are. The only way to truly be an incredible shepherd is do exactly what Jesus did. He humbled himself to the position of a man, came to this earth for us to shepherd us. Sometimes we're going to have to humble ourselves away from some of the great things in life that we're involved in to shepherd. Sometimes we're going to have to say, you know what? If God is truly calling me to do this type of shepherding, I've got to change the way I do life because the two are at odds with each other. And so, really, we have to ask this. May God humble us enough to accept the call that he's asking us all to be, and that's shepherds today. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for the way that you loved us in the way that you had compassion on us and the way that you shepherded us and brought us to the place where we can have peace and assurance and all those great things. But Lord, we realize that in becoming more like you, it's not just in our, in our attitudes or what we do to people or don't do to people, but it, it's in our service. It's in, it's in our shepherding. To become more like you means for us to take on the idea of, of compassion and love to the people that you've put into our lives and have surrounded us with. So, Lord, would you just help us in our attitude and help us in our which box that we serve out of? I ought to do it, Lord, or I'm willing to do it. Because we realize, Lord, if we, we serve out of the ought to, ought to box, it just, it, it's tiring. It's frustrating. It's sad. It's it's robbing, it's, it's fearful. There's all kinds of things that happen there. But, Lord, out of the willingness box, it's, it opens up a whole new door. Lord, Lord, I'm willing to serve you. Lord, I'm willing to, to love them because you love me. Lord, I'm willing, I'm willing, I'm willing. So, Lord, would you just speak to us today in, in, in this shepherding idea, and, and Lord, and not only to bring to our forefront of who we should be shepherding, and, but, Lord, that we would just change our attitude that, in our shepherding of the people that we are shepherding, Lord, that we would just be the most humblest and the most loving and compassionate people we can be. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together.
no turning back. I've been set free, and Christ is enough for me. Christ is enough for me. Everything I need is in you. Everything I need. Christ, my all in all, the joy of my salvation. God of grace who called you to Christ after you've suffered a little while will himself restore you and make you strong firm and steadfast to him be the power forever and ever amen